Sunnyshaw, I'm the Program and Development Coordinator here at the library, and also the organizer of Poem City. <laughs> Poem City is in its 10th year, and I just saw on Facebook yesterday that uh, poets.org just recognized Poem City again. They did a few years ago, and they recognized us again in our 10th year. <laughs> Sponsors: National Life uh, Group Foundation, Vermont Communities Council, Hunger Mountain Co-op, Vermont <coughs> College of Fine Arts, and the Poetry Society of Vermont. And the president of the society, George Lagerdecker, is here with us, and he's a great supporter. <laughs> Not only is he a great supporter as a sponsor, he is one of the volunteers that makes Home City happen. Without him, we'd be sunk. Uh, so I'm really glad that uh, George is part of Poems. And so uh, tonight's program on Earth Day uh, is a celebration of uh, the poetry of Mary Oliver. Uh, and we have Dee Dee Jackson, who's a poet, a published poet, and also teaches creative writing at UVM. She'll be reading um, Mary's poems. And Chris Gruen, who is a poet and also a musician, um, and also the manager of WGDR Community Radio at Goddard College. And so we have a really nice pairing tonight of music and poetry. And I also need to say it's Dee Dee's birthday today. <laughs> and it's really nice that you spend your birthday with us. <laughs> So please help me welcome Dee Dee and Chris. Hi, and thank you. Thanks for bringing us out, and thank you all for coming out. What a what a what a great you know sea of, of faces. And yes, I was born. I was saying earlier on the very first Earth Day ever. And so I was wondering if anyone knows that year. <laughs> I'm revealing my age, so. Um, but yeah, 1970, and um, I always tell my students I always always thought that I might do something like be an environmental scientist of some kind. But I I write poems about a nature and the natural world, and so that um, that is why Mary Oliver's work spoke speaks to me also. So so. Um, much. So uh, tonight, what I'm going to do, I'll let you know, I'm going to read my poems as well, um, and I'll, I'm not going to talk a whole bunch, I don't really want to over explain anything, um, and I'll let you know when uh, you, you, many of you are probably Mary Oliver fans, and um, would, will, will probably recognize her work when I read it, but I do, I'll, I'll kind of clue that in, but um, yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and get started, and I'll occasionally maybe... Um, I thought it'd be nice to just share with you where and when I have um, some influence by her, like where where I have some similarities in my own work and what she did for me as a as a young poet when I was discovering her in my 20s. But um, I'm going to go ahead and just start off right off the bat with a poem that I think is um, a really perfect poem for today, and it's titled North Country by Mary Oliver. In the North Country, now it is spring, and there is a certain celebration. The thrush has come home. He is shy and likes the evening best. Also, the hour just before morning. In that blue and gritty light, he climbs to his branch, or smoothly sails there. It is okay to know only one song, if it is this one. Hear it rise and fall. The very elements of your soul shiver nicely. What would spring be without it? Mostly frogs. But don't worry, he arrives year after year, humble and obedient and gorgeous. You listen, and you know you could live a better life than you do. Be softer, kinder. 
and maybe this year you'll be able to do it. Hear how his voice rises and falls. There is no way to be sufficiently grateful for the gifts we are given. No way to speak the Lord's name often enough. Though we do try, and especially now, as the dappled breast breathes in the pines and heavens, windows in the north country, now spring has come, are opened wide. Rabbits hunt clover 
frame jet across the lawn, tails flashing like two whips of meringue. There are no bells to peal for this day. It passes, nods, its small sorrows receding toward the moment at dusk when the robins return. On days like this, death is so far, a barely audible hum, a slight glint of thaw, the earth a censer for mist and fog. A poem I'm not reading um, that was so influential to me was this poem, Egrets by Mary. And I wanted to mention this one moment when I was in my 20s, and, and, and she writes about um, walking down to this pond and seeing these reeds, and suddenly the reeds unfold into birds, and then the birds trust the air and take flight. And it was that moment that I wanted to reveal the world like she does. I wanted to reveal the world in this metaphor and to explain it like that. And so, and so these poems are my, my best attempt. <laughs> Fall. Do you know what I was, how I lived? Louise Glick. It is a goldfinch, one of the two small girls, both daughters of a friend, sees hit the window and fall into the fern. No one hears the small thump, but she, the youngest, sees the flash of gold against the mica sky as the limp, feathered envelope crumples into the green. How many times in a life will we witness the very moment of death? She wants a box and a small towel, some kind of comfort for this soft body that barely fits in her palm, its head rolling side to side, the neck broke, eyes still wet and black as seed. Her sister, now at her side, wears a dress too thin for the season, white as the winter only weeks away. She wants me to help, wants a miracle. Whatever I say now, I know weighs more than the late fall's layered sky, the jeweled leaves of the maple and elm. I know, too, it is the darkest days I've learned to praise. The calendar packages up time. The days shrink and fold away until the new season. We clothe, burn, then bury our dead. I know this, they do not. So we cover the bird, story its flight, imagine his beak singing. They pick the song and sing it over and over again. Listen. Like a hundred gray ears, the river stones are layered in a pile near the shed, where morning doves slow their peck and bobble to listen to a chorus of listening. Small buds on the lilac perk up. A cardinal's torpedoed call comes in slow waves of four, round after round. It's a love call, a call to make himself known to himself. The stones listen harder, decipher the song, attempt to offer back its echo, but fail. This is not a poem of spring. This is a poem well aware that gray flesh is dead flesh. All of the ripe listening comes at a cost. The first sky is in all skies. The first song is in all songs.
first to learn to trump. Tony on the still sky, after the wind tore up. Just a full of wind and rain, sticks in the garden. And on the way to pass in the garden, crystal candle lights. The street shine in the sun in the wintertime. Associated. It's a little cleaner. Um, I want to make sure I have all my notes here. Well, I'm really, really excited to be here. And uh, happy birthday, Didi. This is a really cool way to celebrate your birthday. I, I want this, too, for my birthday. <laughs> so y'all have to come back. Um, I, like many people, was a huge fan of Mary Oliver. And uh, I started before... Being a singer-songwriter, I started with poetry as an amateur poet at Goddard late in uh, what, uh, like 1997, I think was, right? <laughs> I think that's when I graduated. Um, and before that, um, like 95, 96, I was fortunate enough to take a trip around the world, and take some time off of school, and um, and travel. And uh, before that, I had fallen in love with Mary Oliver. Um, her books started to accompany me everywhere. And uh, when I traveled, I brought her books with me. And I noticed that no matter which group of poets I was uh, flirting with, whether it was uh, late 19th century French poets like Verlaine, or even early not Verlaine, or Rimbaud, or early 20th century, Mary Oliver would be there too in that library. And then uh, later on, Neruda, um, you know, and, and even Stanley Kunitz, a little bit more of a serious uh, uh, writer uh, for that group. But, you know, Neruda and Mary Oliver would always be there. Or 
later the Beats, Mary Oliver was always keeping company. And I started to realize that uh, her work really um, had the spirit of traveling for me, of, of going out, being in love with the natural world, being in love with the world in general. But that what was remarkable was that her poems were, were really um, about delivering you to the nature of yourself, the wilderness of yourself. And wherever I would go, whether it was New Zealand or uh, Nepal or, or wherever it was, her poem would put me uh, in the same place. Wherever I was sitting, whichever riverside or whichever churchyard I was sitting in, it would shoot her poems would return me back to home, to myself. I started to realize this study of the wilderness is really ultimately a study of going in, not going out. Uh, and I think Mary's poems do that. Um, talk a little bit more about that later. It is worth saying that uh, I was also lucky enough to come out of Goddard and start a job as an educator in the area, as a teacher of young people teaching uh, poetry and music. Um, and uh, that, that group was called the Second Sunset Poets. We started in Worcester, then we ended up in Middlesex. We made our way around. We performed on this stage in 2002, I think it was, for first night. And that was a wonderful thing. They always featured their work on WGDR, which was this anchor, um, this, um, this campfire that still is for this community. And then later on, that group evolved into the Hungry Rat Review, which really was Karen McCadden who's sitting here in the front. It was really her uh, brainchild and her creative uh, leadership that brought that group together. And we started working out of Montpelier High School. And we started doing the same thing, performing original music and original poems for folks around here. So in honor of, of Mary, it's nice to be here with all of you. <clears throat> Musical mics. <clears throat> Some just call, I mean, this poem is called A Dream of Trees. It's a Mary Oliver poem. There is a thing in me that dreamed of trees. A quiet house, some green and modest acres, a little way from every troubling town. A little way from factories, schools, laments. I would have time, I thought, and time to spare. With only streams and birds for company, to build out of my life a few wild stanzas. And then it came to me. So was death, a little way away from everywhere.
childhood she turned to the natural world it was her escape and I relate 100% to that um, I found solace in my backyard I lived in Florida which um, some of my poems reveal my move and my fascination with the natural world in the north um, how different it is how I didn't know the trees necessarily and the, the birds. We, we don't have chickadees in Florida, sadly, because I think they're amazing. Um, and, but I too found the, the natural world and in the smallest, the smallest things in the natural world, comfort um, during difficult times. Um, and it's interesting that Mary Oliver, we, we switched. <laughs> she moved to Florida <laughs> in her later years, as you may or may not know, um, and talks about having to really work at learning to love the mangroves, <laughs> which were so very familiar to me. Um, so one other thing I, I, I feel really, in so much way, so many ways, I mean, connected to her and that her adoration of the natural world and the smallest things. I, I wanted to share an essay, but I'm not gonna read a you know, five page essay to you guys today, but um, about her, and you may or may not know this, it's in the Truro Bear, the book, um, where she's watching a spider build a web 
and she, wa- she comes down these steps in this rented house every day and watches the web being built and what happens on the web. The male spider's off to this side. He doesn't quite get on the web. Um, the spider, I love this phrase, she uses the archipelago of um, sacks of, um, around her as she places herself in the center. And, 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 to, and to pay attention to that and then to worry about what's going to come of that spider when she and um, Molly would have to leave when, because they were renting the house and they would have to have a housekeeper come. And, and it's, just, it's just so beautiful. And she has, I wanted, to, um, I wanted to just share one, one sentence from this where she's, she was just curious on the type of spider. It wasn't an orb spider and what kind of web and, and all kinds of things. And, and she admits that she could probably find all this information in, a, in some biology book or, you know, I don't know that she would have gone to Google. I don't know. Because <laughs> she did talk about how she was really adamant about not composing on a computer, like composing with pencil and paper and out in the world. But she said the, 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 um, the palace of knowledge is different from the palace of discovery. And so it's being open to that discovery, that, that, that looking and that close looking. And it's true because then we can learn all the things we need to learn, but to, to discover them for ourselves and maybe not even know all the things. You know, let, that, let the mystery remain. I know she was a, a big um, advocate of mystery and allowing for the mystery. So um, this poem is a Mary Oliver poem. And I wanna, I'm sorry, I wasn't, I, I'm hoping I'm clear enough on which ones are which, but, um, as if I could, you know, anyway, um, <laughs> I shouldn't. <laughs> but um, uh, this is the hermit crab. And growing up in Florida, again, catching hermit crabs. I had a pet hermit crab. His name was Charlie. My dog got a hold of him. It was a horrible demise for poor Charlie. <laughs> but um, but this, this smallness. And the other thing is the, the bravery to leave the familiar for the unfamiliar. Always, always embracing the unfamiliar, because that's part of the discovery and the mystery. The Hermit Crab. Once I looked inside the darkness of a shell folded like a pastry, and there was a fancy face, or almost a face. It turned away and frisked up its brawny forearms so quickly against the light, and my looking in, I scarcely had time to see it, gleaming under the pure white roof of old calcium. When I set it down, it hurried along the tide line of the sea, which was slashing along as usual, shouting and hissing toward the future turning its back with every tide on the past, leaving the shore littered every morning with more ornaments of death. What a pearly rubble from which to choose a house, like a white flower. And what a rebellion to leap into it and hold on, connecting everything, the past to the future, which is, of course, the miracle, which is the only argument there is against the sea. So great. Yeah. Mary. Mary. So um, without much more talk, these are poems, again, inspired by the natural world and Mary. Two mule deer. Walking past my window this morning, female, I think, no antlers, as the day moon pressed like a faded thumbprint into the bare back of the Santa Cruz mountains and the meadow of wild rye and wand buckwheat rocked in the new light. All hide and eyes and hunger moving with caution and blaze. Is there a coming of good? As if their path was already decided, I watched them step into the day, black tip, tail tipped and wide eared. 
So much of what I want isn't even about me. Yesterday, a friend said, the sight of deer means danger is clear. No coyote or mountain lions nearby. Still, I remember what it feels like to be a sidewalk. A sudden girl tamped down at an all-night party, fingered then dropped by a boy who will be dishonorably discharged from the army two years later. You know how it feels, wanting to walk into the rain and disappear. While hiking, a photographer found two deer legs, about 100 feet apart, cloven hooves and dew claws intact, adapted for fleeing predators, left by a hunter. We are only what we are. Don't pity me. A slight steam rises from the backs of the deer as they move past the black oaked edge into the white light, lifting their eyes to the tree line, then to my window, then to the sky, hooves striking the ground over and over like the syllables of a low staccato voice. Also, when um, Mary would go into the, well, she's, she said this, this is interesting. She, she believed a spiritual life was a richer life, although she couldn't quite connect with, you know, um, uh, organized religion. Um, and in school was difficult for her in, in some ways because she just didn't like walls. And she just, even, to, even in her last interview, I think, in, a few years before she died, she just is not like being enclosed in a room. And she wanted to be outside. So she's like, the only really, really broken school was truancy. <laughs> because she just wanted to be out in the woods. And so she would take with her her heroes, her poetry heroes. She'd bring Whitman and uh, Blake, she said, and have conversations um, with them. And I um, I love that. I love that. Um, that interesting self-education in a lot of ways. Um, so, a nation, after William Stafford. A lone doe crosses the border of the dirt road, heaving herself over the plowed snow, becoming a new silence, one of the many that, like standing shadows, beat themselves weary between the wind and ground. Round of belly, she walks with a nation inside of her. And I look and look for the grief I belong to, past the long wall of elm and ash on either side of me, past the car lights that listen ashamed, past the tiny specks of luminous snow that spin and lift like mealy bugs. I think hard for her baby, of Saint Margaret ripping herself from the belly of a dragon, her crucifix slicing an incision, patron saint of childbirth. I whisper a small prayer for the two that already tastes extinguished, all the while knowing Stafford couldn't know every time I read his poem. I want him to save the fawn. He didn't know. He didn't know she is us all pushed over the edge. In my last poem, mine, I have a couple more Mary Oliver poems, um, is titled Signs for the Living. Sometimes after the last snow in May, <laughs> I've lived here a couple of years now, so I know that. Sorry. I'll start again. <laughs> I love it saying that. Okay. I love it. Sometimes, after the last snow in May, after the red winged blackbird clutches the spine of the cattail, after he leans forward, droops his wings, and flashes his epaulets, I imagine shouldering the yellow center lines of the road. Near the recently thawed pond, within a long channel of construction, a man holding a sign. One side says slow, the other stop. 
joy, and sorrow always run like parallel lines. Inside the house, when I leave the lights on, small white moths come like a collection of worship, pulsing their wings up and up the window as if in a frenzied trance-like dance. Some dervishes, others the penitent on shaky knees. The first few years after my husband's suicide, I wanted to be the penitent. I thought I deserved all the pain I could feel. The drill of road work in late summer was a welcome grinding music. Now, the yellow center lines are flung like braids behind me. This is a Mary Oliver poem titled, When Death Comes. When death comes, like the hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut, when death comes like the measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering, what is it going to be like, that cottage of darkness? And therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon the time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower as common as a field daisy and as singular, and each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending as all music does towards silence, and each body a lion of courage and something precious to this earth. When it's over, I want to say, all my life I was a bride married to amazement, I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world.
2000, I started um, thinking about master's programs. And um, I'd been studying Mary Oliver, and I thought, well, Mary's at Bennington. And I, I, I probably couldn't get in. She's highly sought after. She's a superstar. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check it out. And it should be said that I grew up in rock and roll, and I've been exposed to huge celebrities all my life, and I've met the biggest, but I was really starstruck when it came to Mary Oliver. Like, I could meet Bruce Springsteen, that would be fine, but if Mary was going to be there, that, that, was, that would be the pinnacle for me. And, um, and so it didn't seem possible to me that I could just call Bennington and ask for an interview uh, to talk about the program, but sure enough, I called and they, they, were, they were eager to set me up with Mary for an afternoon. I couldn't believe that. I thought, am I the only one thinking about this? <laughs> um, I went there, I went to Bennington, and uh, I waited um, there at the desk uh, and uh, the admissions building or wherever it was. And sure enough, Mary Oliver came down from her, well, from that place that, you know, <laughs> that high, exalted place wherever she uh, spent her time. <laughs> and, uh, it turned out to be a room upstairs at their main building, and uh, and led me upstairs. I'm following Mary up the stairs, and I just I'm just blown away. It was a transcendent experience. I remember this the walking up the stairs, uh, getting a little woozy, and just not knowing what to do, and then starting to sweat bullets. What had I gotten myself into? Like I hadn't prepared anything to say really. I didn't I didn't um, I didn't realize it would just be the two of us, um, but it was. And, uh, and she sat down with me, and she started to ask some questions. She was a little flustered. She was busy. Um, and, uh, and she was trying to ground herself and get her papers organized, and I'm just trying to catch my breath and come up with something smart to say. And, um, and she asked me to talk about myself and what, I, what it was that was drawing me to the program. Um, and there I am trying to expound about the importance of how I spend my time and why I want to do this. But I can't help watching her and every single thing she was doing. She spent a lot of time scratching her head. <laughs> I remember that. She had an itchy scalp and beautiful silver hair. And it's funny how those things are what end up standing out. I don't remember one word I said to her. Um, but I remember what she did with her fingernails and uh, her shoes. Um, finally, she let me off the hook and cut me off. Uh, and said, listen, it sounds like you'd fit the program. Sounds like you'd be great here. There's six or seven students right now that I'm working with that you would join. Um, and, uh, and it sounds like you'd, you'd, you'd be fine, but I want you to know something. I'm just going to tell you to go home and read and write eight hours a day. Exactly. Anyway, that's it. That's, that's, that's what I'm going to say. So if you're doing that now, which I happen to be doing at the time, <laughs> very fortunate. Um, keep doing it. That, that was it. She, she kind of intimated that she didn't have a ton of, of, of reverence for her own schooling, that her schooling was the practice, this deep religion for practice. And, uh, and she talked about, and this kind of confirmed what I was saying earlier, she talked about place and how she, was, she had found her walk around a lake, a pond nearby, that she would do it every single morning. And by being in the same place and doing the same thing every day, she would see what was changing. She would see how the world shifted and be able to write about all the deep wilderness of places because she was practicing so deeply. Um, I took that to heart. I didn't spend the money on school, and I stayed home, and I read a lot of books, including her. 
friends. <laughs> she also said something else. I have a couple of things that really stand out for me that people I really admire said. And um, this I read, like Dee Dee's referencing. I don't know, was that Rules for the Dance? Or, uh, what, where, where you referenced that line of hers. But is that what it's called? Rules for the Rules Dance, for right? the Dance. Yeah. She had a, she had a book about, about writing poetry. It was a technical uh, study, and one of the things that stood out for me in there, she said it takes 72 hours to pull a poem into the light, which pointed so directly at the editing process that so much of her magic had to do with sitting with what first came out, you know, and what first came out for amateurs is the only thing that matters. But once you become a stronger writer, you start to realize that the real, the real writing happens in the revisions and the movement and the sculpting of the poem later. I love that. 72 hours. So that's it. No more, no less. <laughs> right. I'm going to read uh, one more of hers. Um, and then I think we're going to come, come to a close with, with Dee Dee. That great pond. That great pond, the sun rising, scrapes its orange breast on the thick pines, and down tumble a few orange feathers into the dark water. On the far shore, a white bird is standing, like a white candle, or a man in the distance, in the clasp of some meditation while all around me the lilies are breaking open again, breaking open again from the black cave of night. Later, I will consider what I have seen, what it could signify, what words of adoration I might make of it. And to do this, I will go indoors to my desk. I will sit in my chair, I will look back into this lost morning in which I am moving now, like a swimmer, so smoothly, so peacefully. I am almost the lily, almost the bird vanishing over the water on its sleeves of night. Let's make 
So, so recently, this was just a really beautiful evening of beautiful music and poems. So I, I'm just gonna I, I'm I'm just gonna close with one poem. I shared it with my students when um, I learned that Mary had died. One of my students actually had this. He actually did this, and so you'll you'll see. It's, I think it's really cool. The Summer Day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. The one who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious 